Hello, welcome back. So um, in the last recording, uh, we discussed this new type of potential energy known as the Leonard Jones potential energy, this LJ stands for Leonard Jones, or also the a pairwise, sometimes we refer to as a, more generally as a pairwise potential energy because it describes an interaction between a pair of particles they could be atoms or molecules, but they're um, neutral. They're not charged. And we saw how they interact as a function of separation between them. But of course, these particles are also in motion. So we wanna incorporate the idea of kinetic energy. So how do we understand um, the kinetic energy of these particles that are interacting with this Leonard Jones potential? And then eventually we'll start thinking about how do we connect the, these ideas of um, the Leonard Jones potential energy and kinetic energy between just two atoms back to the idea of thermal and bond, and bond energy for macroscopic, so large substance consisting of many, many atoms. Um, how do we connect uh, those ideas, thermal and bond energy to this atomic uh, interaction between particles. Okay, so let's just quickly review the important um, physical properties of this potential. So we uh, discussed how there is an equilibrium separation between the two atoms when they're not feeling any force pushing them apart or together. This is, uh, we call that R naught, and it happens to be 1.12 times the <clears throat> atomic diameter. So it's when the two particles are not quite touching, but they're very, very close together. Then we saw that when the separation becomes basically around one, when they're touching a little bit less, if you were to try to squeeze these two particles together, then you get a really strong repulsive force. So the reason behind this is actually quantum mechanical. You might have encountered that in your chemistry classes. It's, it is known as a Pauli exclusion principle, which basically forbids electrons to occupy the same orbitals. So in other words, you can't have um, uh, these orbitals overlapping. So it's kind of beyond the scope of this course, so you don't need to worry about it, but just keep in mind uh, this effect is uh, quantum mechanical. All right, now if you go to a distance which is farther than equilibrium, then you get an attractive force. So if you actually look very close to the, around the equilibrium position, you get very spring mass like behavior where the uh, atoms just wanna return to their equilibrium position. But as you get farther apart, this attraction that wants to bring them back to equilibrium gets weaker and weaker until we get to around um, three atomic diameter separation. So they're still rather close together when they basically stop interacting. So the force becomes really, really small as, and as you bring them farther apart, um, it basically goes to zero. <clears throat> so we're gonna kind of think about that shortly uh, what does that mean um, as far as thinking about bonds? Uh, are the two particles bound together or not? Mm. All right, so now let's think about kinetic energy. So we can define our total energy for uh, assuming it's a closed system, so there's no other outside source of energy. We can define the total energy as the sum of kinetic and potential energy. And let's just, uh, for the sake of thinking about it, assume that for a given pair of uh, particles, the total energy is right here. So it's minus 0.5 epsilon more or less. So if we knew that this is the total energy and we know what the potential energy looks like at all separations, we can actually just um, get the kinetic energy by subtracting the uh, potential energy from the total energy. So if we look at, so the, the, this green plot right here represents a kinetic energy. And let's just double check that it's correct. So at any point along here, uh, when we add these two, we should get the total energy. So um, 
right here where the kinetic energy is set to be zero, if we look down, um, the potential energy is exactly minus uh, 0.5 epsilon, or in other words, the potential energy crosses the total energy. So when that's true, when the potential energy equals to the total energy, the kinetic energy has to be zero. So this is true on both ends here. So right here and so here and here, there are two places where the total energy crosses a potential energy. So then the kinetic energy has to be zero. Okay, let's look at the extreme value here. So we see about 0.5 plus minus one gives us this minus 0.5. So at that point, um, it's uh, consistent as well. And then anywhere in between. So the way, whenever you're making these plots, it's always a good idea to look at these like kind of extreme values. One kinetic energy goes to zero, then the, that maximum. And then as for the rest, you just make a plot which exactly mirrors um, the potential energy plot because then you know when you add them, you get the straight line. <clears throat> All right. So as you've probably noticed, we have these regions here, sh the shaded regions here where it says forbidden. What does that mean? Well, let's think about given this total energy, is it possible for these particles to have a separation which is larger than, let's say, this almost 1.4 um, diameters that we get here? So if we were to assume that, let's say, yes, they could be there, what would that mean? Um, if we look at a separation somewhere right here, what even uh, 1.4, what do we notice? We notice that the potential energy there is bigger than the total energy. So if this is bigger, what does that tell us about kinetic energy? The only way that we can still um, have this being true is that kinetic energy became negative. So if we were to extend this just by, without thinking about the physical meaning of it, but just graphically, then both on this side and on this side, kinetic energy would have to go zero in order to um, abide by this conservation of energy rule. But of course we know that unlike total and potential energy, kinetic energy cannot be zero because kinetic energy has to do with motion and it goes as one half mv squared. So there's no way that you can have a negative number for kinetic energy. So what that means is that it's not physically possible or at least classically, quantum mechanics has some exceptions that we won't go into it, but classically it's not physically possible for these two particles to have a separation which is less than that value where the kinetic energy goes to uh, zero or bigger than this value right here. Um, so what does that tell us about the motion or the behavior of these particles? Well, um, they, oscillate about this equilibrium position, but with the limit of these of this two separations. So basically, let's say the separation is somewhere over here, they keep on oscillating farther apart. And when they reach this separation, which is, you know, almost 1.4, there's just not enough energy for them to go farther apart, because there's this force that wants to bring them back together. So then they come back together. So kind of Think about it in terms of a spring mass. Once you pull a spring mass a certain distance apart, that's how much energy you give it. When you release it, there's, as long as there's no outside energy being added, that spring mass cannot oscillate at a separation farther than that initial displacement for equilibrium that you gave it. So it's kind of the same idea. You give it this total energy and that creates this limit around uh, which the two particles can oscillate. So then, you know, um, here they, they have some maximum kinetic energy. So they try to fly closer together, but then they slow down as they get closer and closer together until they reach this point where they've reached their maximum energy they can have, and then they keep on going. So because of this structure, in a sense, because that there is a limit or a range of separations that this pair can have, we call this pair bound. So this 
particular value of total energy result, results in an interaction uh, of two bound particles. Okay, so now let's look at another example. So unlike with a spring mass, so a spring mass, you know, your typical spring mass we learned uh, about um, a couple of weeks ago, that one doesn't matter how far you, I mean, unless you actually break the spring, but it doesn't matter how far you move it away from equilibrium, it's gonna have that range. But this potential acts a little bit different because as you recall, as you make the separation farther and farther apart, the two particles stop interacting. So now let's think about a completely different value of total energy of plus 0.5 epsilon. So if that total energy was positive, let's see what that means. Well, um, so kind of the green plot is sort of overlapping the red one, but we know that the potential energy kind of goes up here. So there is gonna be a value where the total energy crosses the potential energy somewhere around there. And that's exactly, again, for the same reasons as in the previous slide, that's again when um, our kinetic energy goes to zero. So there is, a separation beyond which the two particles cannot be. So they cannot get closer than, you know, this almost one diameter separation. But on the right side of this plot, if you look at total energy, it never crosses a potential energy anymore. So what does that mean? When we um, subtract the potential energy from the total energy here, around these separations, we see that because the potential energy goes to zero, uh, kinetic energy just equals to the total energy. So what you see on this extreme is that the kinetic energy kind of just goes asymptotically towards the total energy. There's still this maximum kinetic energy right here. So let's just check that 1.5 minus one exactly gives us that 0.5. So we're still consistent, we still have this kind of mirror image um, shape of the two plots, except the big physical difference now is that there is no limit on the farther separation these two particles can have. Um, so if we go to kind of infinity separation, a very large separation, these two particles will have just have this constant kinetic energy, uh, which equals to 0.5. So in this case, the two, we say that the two particles are no longer bound. And again, why is that? Because they have enough energy to, to just fly off at infinity or very large separations. If they do happen randomly, so you can think about this as some kind of gas, which is confined uh, in a container and these two uh, gas particles are free to move around. If they do happen to by accident because they're bouncing off walls and stuff of the container, get close together, then you know it's separations close to the equilibrium, they will interact this way, they will feel a force as they get closer together, repelling them apart. But once they get close together and then they repel apart, they will just fly off at infinity. There's basically nothing that will keep the two, the pair oscillating about this equilibrium position. So this again, amount of total energy makes this pair unbound. So we're gonna a little bit later or mostly focused in the next recording, think about how um, these ideas will translate to our definition of bond energy and what does it mean when you go through a phase transition um, to, to break those, those bonds. <clears throat> All right, so actually speaking of that, I want you to think about this question based on what uh, I just told you in the two previous slides. So if a bond is broken in this atom-atom potential or this Leonard-Jones potential, which of the following must be true? So think about these choices and again, go back, pause the video, go back if you didn't quite understand everything from the previous two slides and think about what exactly made one pair bound versus the other second example unbound. All right, so let's look at the answer. And the answer is that the total energy has to be bigger or zero uh, or 
uh, greater than zero. So let's think about all the other ones to make sure that they don't make sense as a correct answer. So when the total energy is less than zero, remember that that means it's below this axis. So if you draw that line, you could see that it will always cross this potential energy on the right. And as long as it crosses, it's on the right. What does that mean? It means that the kinetic energy has to go to zero there. So that's the farthest distance they can be apart. So if there is basically a limit to that maximum um, value of separation, that's what makes that pair bound. So this cannot be true. That's actually a condition for it being bound or not broken. Okay, potential energy is less than zero. Well, a bound or unbound uh, pair can still have negative potential energy. Remember when the two particles do, as I mentioned by accident, get close together, they will still interact with this potential energy. So they can still exist. Um, that pair can still be present at these distances around equilibrium, potential energy is zero. So it's not there that they're always uh, infinitely apart at the location when the potential energy is basically zero. So that's possible. Potential energy greater than bigger than zero, you know, that's true around here. And again, that is possible whether it's broken or unbroken. And then choice E um, just doesn't make sense for any type of question because kinetic energy can never be negative. As we've discussed, it can only be positive. So why is this one correct? Well, we see that, you know, if we start with some negative total energy, that gives you your range of motion. As we add more and more energy, that range gets bigger and bigger until we get to exactly zero total energy. And if we then draw the line, because on this side, the potential energy is always right below zero. So that's kind of the first value when um, there's no longer an upper limit to the separation that the two particles can have. So it's exactly at zero or anything higher then our bond becomes broken. Okay, so we're gonna start kind of slowly thinking about um, taking out what we've developed about with this particle model of matter, thinking about uh, interactions on atomic level, so microscopic level, and move back to trying to explain this, uh, the macroscopic concepts of thermal and bond energy in terms of these microscopic ideas. So what's macroscopic? Well, that's around, that's much more than just two particles. That's, you know, kind of around Avogadro number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. So that's what we would consider macroscopic. And there we described uh, this internal energy in terms of thermal and bond energy. And how, we can, how can we kind of directly think about that many particles, but describe it in terms of its microscopic energies? Well, we could say that each particle at some instant of time has some kinetic energy if it's moving around. Uh, and then each pair of particles has this some potential energy. So what we're gonna think about is, well, if we need to describe that many, then we just have to sum up all the energies. <clears throat> okay, so our goal again here is to, can we describe thermal and bond energy in terms of the kinetic and the potential energy of the individual particles? Okay, so let's just go back to just thinking about two particles and think about um, for those two particles, can we use these words of bond and thermal energy? So what was the total energy um, back when we were talking about our macroscopic system? Well, it, uh, for any given material in, in any phase, we could think about it having some thermal energy and bond energy. So was the sum of these two, on a microscopic scale, now we're thinking about in terms of kinetic and potential energy. Um, so we would have to sum up, if we're still talking about that same material now with many particles, we have to sum all the kinetic energies and sum all the potential energies. 
So you might think by just looking at this, well, isn't bond energy just some of all the potential energies because bonds have something to do with uh, how the two particles interact. So that's potential energy. And then thermal energy has something to do with the random motion of the particle. So that has to do with the kinetic energy. So that would be nice, but it's not quite that simple. So let's, let's kind of think about it a little bit deeper. So what is bond energy? Well, we know that, imagine we go back to zero temperature. So what is zero temperature implies? It implies that there's no motion present. So everything is frozen in space, or in other words, all of our particles are exactly at, so we, we basically start with the lowest possible total energy you can have, which is minus one. So that's right there when all of our particles are at their equilibrium position, there's no motion. So we define that total energy or that energy as the bond energy of the system. So why is that? Well, if we think back to our three phase model, what did that tell us? For example, for, you know, if we start with a solid at some very low temperature, it, when you add energy to that, what is happening? What's happening is it's thermal energy is increasing before it starts going through a phase transition, but the bond energy is staying fixed. So that means that whatever bond energy you had at that zero, absolute zero temperature has to be the same bond energy that you will have as you increase uh, your energy before you break the bond. So basically we defined bond energy equals to that total energy at zero temperature when there's no kinetic energy present. So then if we do have a total energy, which is uh, bigger than minus one, let's say minus 0.4s in this graph, what does that tell us? Again, when we added this total energy right here, we still have a pair of bond particles, bound particles, sorry. That means that you have not broken that bond. So the bond energy has to be the same. So then what's the difference between that total and bond energy? It has to be that thermal energy. Because again, as you're adding more and more energy above that zero temperature case, what you're doing is you're increasing temperature. And that's exactly how we define thermal energy. It's, it's the energy that increased when temperature was changing. But another interesting thing that happens as you add this total energy, what is changing exactly in terms of potential and kinetics? So I don't have the kinetic energy plotted here, but you can kind of picture it up there. So as you add thermal energy, what you're doing is you're adding some average potential energy or you're increasing, I mean, the average potential energy, what tells you, you know, that's kind of is related to the separation that the two particles can have, but you're also increasing an average kinetic energy. And it turns out that you're increasing them by the same amount. So if we wanna now define potential and kinetic energy in terms of the bond and thermal energy, the way we can think about it is potential energy part. So let's say we have this total, total energy. So it has that bond energy always, which is defined at um, zero temperature, plus this average potential energy that appears due to having some non-zero thermal energy. And if the two, are, if the thermal energy is kind of split between having some potential and kinetic energy perfectly half and half, and we'll discuss this idea more later, then you know the other a half of thermal energy has to go to the kinetic energy. So again, as you add thermal energy, you have some average potential energy um, that the two particles have and average kinetic energy, which gets split in uh, half and half. Another way you can think about this is for example, uh, because this system is a little bit more abstract. If we go back to our spring mass system and let's say, 
we have it oscillating. We pull it a little bit down and it oscillates, right? Now let's say we wanna add more energy. So we wanna increase that total energy. What do we have to do? I have to pull it a little bit more. Now it oscillates more. So we didn't only increase its range of kinetic energy, how fast it oscillates. Of course, you know, as you add more energy, it will oscillate on average faster. It will move faster at equilibrium. So if you think about it as an average kinetic energy, we'll have more, but we've also added potential energy to it. Why is that? Because now it has that bigger range of oscillation. So in other words, we cannot add energy to a spring mat system without adding some energy to kinetic energy and energy to potential energy. We can't just speed it up in other words, our spring mass without also increasing its potential energy. So that's kind of the basic idea here. All right, a couple of questions for you to think about. <clears throat> if we have a bond and it's considered stronger, so let's actually go back here a little bit so I can kind of help you think about this. So how do we break this bond again? Remember, we had to add a certain number of energy until this total energy goes to zero. And we said that, you know, any time that it's below zero, we have some bond energy. And whenever it goes to zero or above, now that bond is broken and the, two, the particles are unbound. So having keeping that in mind, what do you think? If a bond is considered stronger, so let's say we're... Um, we're comparing two separate pairs of particles and we just say one is stronger than the other. In other words, one has a bigger bond energy than the other. What does that mean? So there are two parameters I'm asking you to think about, the well depth, epsilon, and also the sigma, which is the particle diameter. What do you think it depends on? So think about this, go back to the Leonard-Jones potential to take a look. So the answer is a stronger bond means greater well depth and it has nothing to do with the diameter. So why is that? The diameter would just, if you, if you took this plot and you put it in units, let's say of meters instead of particle diameter, all it would do, it was shift it right or left relative to each other. So if we're looking at two particles with greater diameter versus smaller, then you know, the one with a greater diameter would have our Leonard-Jones potential here. Bond energy, or uh, basically the amount of energy required to break a bond has to do with this well depth because you have to add this amount of energy from minus epsilon to zero to break that bond. So you could think about the change in bond energy to break that bond has to do with our final state. So we wanna get to the position where the potential energy goes to zero to that total energy. So the potential energy at the separation when they're much, much bigger than our naught, so they're, the bond is broken, they're no longer constrained, minus our initial state, which is um, when the particles are exactly at equilibrium. So it's that amount of energy you need to add to go from bond energy of minus epsilon to bond energy of zero, basically, that defines breaking that bond. So it's going final state zero, initial state minus epsilon, when you to subtract the two, it's the well depth. So it's exactly that well depth, this value of epsilon, remember this has units of joules. So if we're comparing two bonds, one is stronger than the other, they will have a different value of epsilon. And that bigger that value of epsilon is, the stronger will be the bond. In other words, the more energy you will need to add it add. Um, so the greater the value of epsilon, the more energy you'll need to add to break that bond. So greater well depth and no constraint on sigma. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. It just matters um, this, this value of potential energy. That's what matters. <clears throat> All right. A couple of questions to think about this relationship now between total thermal, uh, total energy, thermal energy, and, and bond energy. Okay, so we have a pair of atoms that are interacting via this atom-atom potential and our Jones potential, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, only these two atoms are around. Okay, 
So there's no other source of external energy. If two different, so in these two different situations, the pair have a different amount of total energy. So here and here, situation A and B, different value of total energy, or maybe not. Uh, in which situation is E total greater? So just take a look at the plot, make your decision. Okay, situation B clearly has a total bond energy. This question I mostly ask you because sometimes the negative signs are confusing. Uh, so of course the less negative the total energy is, so as you move up in that direction, you're gonna have a larger value of total energy. So here we have minus 0.5 and here it's minus 0.2 and that's a bigger number. So more total energy, what does that mean? A larger range of available separations over which these two particles can exist and oscillate. Okay, same situation. Now I'm asking you in which situation is bond energy greater? Remember, we're talking about the same two atoms interacting. The only difference between them is that they have a different value of total energy. Bond energy is gonna be the same for both because bond energy is just defined at the value when the two particles are at equilibrium. So at minus epsilon. And because we're talking about the same pair of atoms, um, they have to have the same well depth. So bond energy can only be different if we're talking about kind of like in the previous uh, clicker question, when we're talking about two different um, pairs of atoms. So let's, let's say you're talking about hydrogen ver versus oxygen, which one has a bigger potential? Well, here it's the same atoms. The only difference is their total energy. So they have to have the same bond energy, which is minus epsilon, <clears throat> the two situations. All right, and now lastly, what about thermal energy? So go back a couple of, pause the video and go back a few um, to review exactly the relationship between total bond and thermal energy. Okay, let's look at the <clears throat> answer. Um, it's again, situation B, because how do we find thermal energy? Well, total energy equals to bond plus thermal. So thermal is total minus bond. Remember the bond is the same for both. So then the one with a greater total energy has to have a greater thermal energy. Thermal energy, remember, is that distance from here to here. So here um, you could see that's a smaller thermal energy of about 0.5, where here it's 0.8. So again, situation B, greater thermal energy. Okay, that's it for uh, this recording. Next time what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, so so far here, we've thought about just still two particles and what does it mean uh, to define its bond energy and specifically how do we define or how do we think about the amount of energy that we need to add to break that bond? So we're gonna go now next, we're gonna move from just thinking about two particles to thinking about of a Gajra number of them in other words, going from microscopic size to a macroscopic size. All right, thank you for listening and see you soon.